Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's Material Issues, episode number 81. And you know, we've had material issues in the past. So right now, I'm checking out anybody who is live with us. Um, I want to have, I'm not going to say who it is yet, but uh, I want somebody who is on the phone to just give me a hello, 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 check, check, check. If you will do that for me, phone. All right. Now, Pete, <laughs> Jeremy, I see that you're live with us. Can you hear our caller saying hello, hello, hello? Anybody who is, I, I see a bunch of people are, are with us already. So let me know if you're hearing other voices than mine in the comments. Yeah. Ah. Ah, they said they say no, we can't hear the yeah, caller. So something is going on here. Hold on. Hold on. Oh, wait. Here it's hey, now I hear him. There we go. Ladies and gentlemen, oh. we've got it fixed. I'm going to have the caller just wait on by. Here we go. We figured it out. <laughs> is, <laughs> is Dave is is Dave with us? Dave? Yeah, I'm here, I'm here, Rocky. And he and he Oops, hears sorry. you too. Thank you. Oh gosh, Almighty! You know what? Sometimes with material issues, it just takes a little bit of sweat. <laughs> Gee, Ladies somebody's not talking. <laughs> What's that? Somebody pulled up. Somebody just pushed the plug in and not telling the not telling the whole story. It's like the airplane movie. They just unplugged the, the whole runway. I think, it, I think it was the boogeyman. Get it? Oh, it sorry. The yeah. Well, no, I've been living with the boogeyman for three days now, so <laughs> I, I can understand why it's happening. Oh Lord! Well, <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you what. You know, we've been goofing off here now for a couple of minutes. This is Material Issues, episode number 81. I'm Mark Hirschberger of Pop Detective Records. Joining me as always out in the West Coast, my good friend of the International Pop Overthrow Festival, Mr. David Bash. How are you, David? And I'm we're doing International Pop Overthrow. Man, that sounds like a, <laughs> Doesn't that sound a terrorist unit. <laughs> yes, we, we are a terrorist unit. You know, we're taking great pop music and overthrowing all, all the crap that's out there. <laughs> and well, I, that's going to that's gonna take some doing right there. I'll tell you that. And I, and it it, it always does, yeah. If you are joining us live, normally David and I would talk a little bit about things and, and uh, going on in our lives and and festivals and such, but we'll we'll do that at the end of the show because we have our caller and a very special guest on the line with us right now. And I know there's a lot of people who've been waiting to to hear this guy talk. So without further ado, let's welcome to Material Issues, a very good friend, Rocky Burnett, the son of rock and roll. Good afternoon, Rocky. Mark, David, thank you, man. I'm glad we're we got this thing working. Yeah, me too. Great, great to speak with you again. Great to speak with you again, Rocky. It's been about uh, 23 years, I think. But yeah, um, with with Richie and Bill Cooper and Dwight Twilley. Yeah, uh, listening to a great album. I miss Richie. You know, I was really, uh, you know. Richie's been with me all my life. My my Richie cut records with my dad and my uncle. Right when he got out of the Navy and uh, started setting up a little studio over there on Ventura Boulevard, American Studios, and uh, uh, that's where they cut Alley Oop, you know, with, uh, uh, with uh, was it Gary or Larry Paxton and the Ho Hollywood Argyles? The Hollywood uh, yes. Argyles. Tim yeah. Fowley wrote the, the track. Hollywood Argyles. Yeah. Oh, Alley Oop. Well, we got we got a couple of people checking in. I know you can't see the screen, Rocky, because you're calling in from uh, from the landline. But um, uh, Jeremy Holiday says hello. Dwight Twilley is online joining us right now, and he is oh, Twileximo. Twileximo is what he just wrote himself. So uh, <laughs> Twileximo, don't mind. Tim Allen yeah. checked in. He said this is going to be great. So we got a number of people on the line just to hear. Hear a little bit of your story, Rocky. It's an absolute thrill for me, um, not only as a huge fan of your dad, uh, his work with Johnny Burnett and the Rock and Roll Trio, and a huge fan of your album, Son of Rock and Roll, in 1980. Um, Dwight Twilley just said, Rock Man. 
And uh, yes. <laughs> what I you know, what I'd like to do, Rocky, if we can start off a little bit, if you can go back to uh, your childhood a little bit and talk uh, talk a bit about your legendary rockabilly dad, Johnny Burnett, with uh, Dorsey and Paul Burleson, and give us a little bit what it was like as a kid to be around a dad like that. Well, it, it was a lot of fun. Yeah. The first thing, and he was. Uh, you know, we uh, we grew up around Memphis, and uh, of course, when my dad was young and 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 in school, uh, they were my dad and Dorsey could get into a lot of trouble. <laughs> so my grandmother put him in Catholic school because that's where the priest could knuckle down on him. See, they weren't Catholic, but uh, <laughs> she just wanted the discipline for them. <laughs> Meanwhile, all their friends went to Hume High School, which is where Elvis went, and my aunt Alberta went, and uh, uh, my dad and Dorsey, they'd go over there and sit on the lawn and play their guitars and stuff like that. And in the early days with Lee Densett and Alvis Scova and uh, wow. Johnny and Bill Black, you know, uh, some of the kids that, uh, you know, hung around there and played around there. They also uh, were m members of the uh, Golden Gloves, so they were... They were boxing uh, from Catholic High early on, and my dad played football. He was the captain of the football team. But the way they paid for their, their recording equipment, when my grandmother, you know, didn't help them out, was they'd box. Wow. And that's how they got their first guitars. That's how Dorsey bought his first big albino bass. <laughs> and, uh, you know, on the weekends they'd be playing, and on the weekdays they'd be working out, ready for their next uh, boxing match. But... Uh, it was they, Paul used to tell the stories of how when they'd play at the Cotton Club or some of the little local places around there or a little a sock hop type thing. You know, a lot of the farm boys would like to come out from uh, Mississippi and the surrounding areas of Arkansas and Tennessee, and they always like to pick on the band. <laughs> well, this was the one band you didn't want to pick on. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and my dad, my dad, and Paul and uh, and uh, and Dorsey, Dorsey. Dorsey was a professional and had, uh, he used to be Sonny Liston's sparring partner. Up wow. 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 So, you know, uh, when, when my uncle hit you, you'd felt it down to your toes. <laughs> and when some of these farm boys would come in and want to, you know, show off in front of their girlfriends. Yeah. Well, they didn't show off very long. And, <laughs> you know, that's, uh, and Dorsey, that's the way they started. And if you listen to their music and, uh, this new uh, documentary that's called Raised on Rock, you hear one of the stray cats talk about right. uh, it was the wildness of that uh, rock and roll trio record that really put the impetus on what they were doing. Right. So, uh, yeah, so if you listen to Train Kept Rolling or, you know, uh, Classic. Uh, uh, Honey Hush or, you know, uh, Tear It Up, all those songs, I mean, they're just wild. And, and you're talking about, 19 and 20 year old kids going into a studio for the first time yeah, yeah, and coming out with this rock and roll rockabilly record that was really, uh, uh, pawn, uh, pawn stars, you know, that TV show, right? Yeah. Uh, last week, last week, they just had a thing where, uh, Chumley had of bought a bunch of Chumley. Yeah. <laughs> he had Chumley bought all these records, but he paid like uh, a thousand bucks for all these records. But, the guy went through them that, you know, they always have a, a, a pro that knows what's right. what's <laughs> what. And he just said, this ain't worth anything. This ain't worth anything. And he pulls out the rock, Johnny Burnett and the rock and roll trio album. And he says, this is the Holy grail right here. Oh my this God. is a, this, this is an album that just, you know, some of these records, especially the little, the, the smaller version, the English version is like 12 instead of 14 inches. And, it's gone as high as five and ten thousand yeah. dollars. Oh my gosh! Uh, but John John Lennon and Paul McCartney used to fight for the record. They had one copy of it, and John would find it at Paul's house and take it back, and Paul would find it at John's house and take it back. Hmm. Albert Lee and Mick Fleetwood, and uh, you know a lot of the guys from the you know the British Invasion. I mean, that's what they cut their teeth on was that rock and roll trio record. Well, it's amazing. I don't mean to interrupt, but what's amazing is how many bands have covered songs from that album. You mentioned Honey Hush before, and of course, you know, Rockabilly Boogie with Robert Gordon. And uh, believe it or not, I found out about Little, um, and this is, well, this is a song that your dad did later, Little Boy Sad. But I found out about oh, yeah. that song 
through, some, through an Australian band called MP, uh, MPD Limited. Uh, <laughs> and uh, they did a slower version of it. And uh, which is really good, by the way. But it's yeah. I mean, if 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 there's any legacy that your you know that your dad and your uncle left, it was all those all these people who covered these songs, all these versions. It's really incredible. Yeah, it's oh, yeah. yeah, and uh, you know, a lot of times they don't get the credit they deserve. You know, they should have been in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame decades ago. Uh, anybody that's a direct influence on Elvis and the Beatles. Yeah. should be remembered somewhere in what they call the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. But, you know, Agreed. that's uh, another thing. I was talking to uh, Johnny Rivers not too long ago, and he goes, you know what, with your dad and your uncle not in there, and Paul, I don't even care if they ever put me in there, because I've been wondering if they were going to ever mention me. But if he ain't in there, nobody should be in there. And that's, you know, wow. that was uh, yeah. a nice compliment to pay. And, yeah. you know, the, the thing is, is... Uh, you know, me and Billy had, you know, a, a career of, of our own. You know, Billy was in Fleetwood Mac there for a while. But our dad and our uncle and, and Paul, man, they created something that was really unique. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of, like uh, Alan Freed says, rock and roll's a river of many streams. But they had that, you know, you're talking about a three-piece band. And you got to give Grady Martin credit for it too, because Grady, and it says it right there on the album, yeah. guitar, you know, Grady Martin, Paul played, my uncle played, my dad played, they all played guitar. But uh, when it came, my uncle loved playing the bass, but it tore up his fingers. <laughs> and he it? preferred, because he, he was such a songwriter, to play the guitar, but. And for, you know, for, for, those, for, the band. for those who might be watching when we're, when we're alluding to your uncle, that's Dorsey Burnett, who is your dad's brother. And that's Johnny and Dorsey in the rock and roll trio. And then you mentioned Billy. Well, that's Dorsey's son, Billy Burnett, your cousin. And that, you know, yeah. so just so for people with context, I know there's some people who know the whole story that are on here, but there's other people watching that may not know who you're talking about when you mentioned Billy. So that's, that's, that's the Burnett clan in a small nutshell. <laughs> so to speak yeah and you know billy's had a rough week because one of his yeah. best friends christine mcgee uh mm. passed away the other day and uh yeah. you know i was on the road with them for a long time i in fact i introduced billy to mick and the rest of the band right yeah. and uh she was always so sweet to me just just really a, a sweetheart of a person and a great talent and what a what a voice i mean yeah. i when i met her she was going out with dennis wilson Right. Yeah. I never met I never met Dennis in the vertical position. He was always horizontal on my uh, anvil case. <laughs> well, we know about Dennis being horizontal. He's, that's legendary. A little bit different in this case, but Well, Dennis said, uh, "Man, I, I I loved your old man, but I like your anvil case better." <laughs> Well, he that, played there until Fleetwood Mac got their show off and then they'd go back to their go back to their room, but uh you know, they were they were kind of in love right then during the Tusk tour. You know, that was uh, well. Yeah, that's when they were together. Your your uh, John, your dad Johnny uh, died in the boating accident when he was thirty two. Um, so you yeah, were thirty thirty actually. Okay, so you were yeah. not you were not that old um, when that happened. But when you were a kid, did you have a sense of what your dad was doing musically, or you know, the, or or that he was? Um, well, I remember, somebody. you know, uh, I was three, I think I was around three years old when uh, they first came on the Ted Mack show, you yeah. know, and uh, coming from New York. And then they won it three times. So through those next three weeks, everything was, oh, it was, uh, we, we lived on this place called Warden Road and we all like kind of lived together. Mm. And uh, times were tough back then. You know, we, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we kept, we stayed together and we, we lived together and uh, well, my grandmother, my dad, and Johnny Cash had tried to make some extra bucks, so they sold televisions. <laughs> wow! And, uh, yeah, and, and I think my, 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 the only one my my dad sold was to my grandmother, and the only one Johnny Cash sold was to his mother. <laughs> so we were all sitting around the TV and had all the neighbors around. The first time they did the the, the Mac show, and uh, Elvis sent us over a a, a telegram. And uh, said, "Go get them, rebels!" 
And of course he called my dad and Dorsey and Paul, the Dalton brothers, because they were always getting in trouble. <laughs> but, uh, you know, they all loved each other and they, you know, we realized, we realized early on that Memphis had become a one man town, you know, it was an Elvis town. And yeah. Of course, they had Sam Phillips and a lot of other great artists, too, you know, but uh, we packed up everything and moved to California. Mm. And kind of, uh, kind, of like, kind of like you and Jed and, and, and Granny and everybody else. Uh, was, that, was that culture shock for you, Rocky? Well, you know, it was in a lot of ways, but uh, we, we came out to uh, Dorsey had been here for a couple of months working for Faber Robinson. Uh, who would later have From a Jack to a King with Ned Miller. Anyway, uh, he came out, and he caught us coming into the San Fernando Valley, and we were on Lancashire Boulevard, and he says, I want you to come over here, and we went to this place called Baker's Tacos. And he says, I want you guys to have some tacos, because we didn't know anything about Mexican food. <laughs> and, man, we started eating tacos, and me, my brother and my cousins haven't stopped eating tacos for 65 years. <laughs> What, what what's your favorite place now? My favorite place for tacos? Yeah. Oh geez, let's see. If I if I could go right now and get a taco, I love Tito's down by the airport. That's a that's a good taco. Uh, you know, I just had one of uh, the actors' tacos uh, uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, Danny uh, uh, Trejo. Oh. I had one of his tacos. It was really good. Uh, I used to, we, me and Billy and Dorsey, when we'd come back from the studio, we used to stop at a place in uh, North Hollywood called, uh, 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 Ernie's tacos. I know that place. They were a little bit different. They were a little bit different and they had the different, you know, the real Mexican cheese. Yeah. But if you wanted, if you wanted just a really great taco, you go to Alvera street and there's this lady named Rosarita and she's right at the front of, of the place and she's. She's she's making the tortillas right in front of you out of the mouth of the flour, <laughs> or the mouth of corn, and she'll make you the best taco you've ever had. But I just before we go talking about tacos, when we first got here from from Memphis, we moved into this little apartment uh, uh, building, and there was this lady named Alice Sanchez, and she was married to an Irishman, Joe Kelly. <laughs> so her name was Alice Kelly, and she taught us how to make tacos. And my rock tacos here in California, everybody from John Scott to John Hyde to uh, uh, some of the great recording artists of our day, Glenn Campbell loved my rock tacos. <laughs> so I make rock tacos and rockamole, and uh, uh, I'm famous for my I'm famous for my Mexican food. I mean, how, how it's many, a little how on many, the gringo side, but it's really good. I'm coming <laughs> over and having some. <laughs> Yeah, well, let's do it. <laughs> how many rock? How many rock and roll shows, material issues like that? Are you going to get such great taco recommendations from somebody like Rocky Burnett? This is I don't fantastic. know, but that, you know, that's my middle name, man. I, <laughs> I I live and breathe tacos. Have you ever been to Paquito Mas? I use a taco right now. <laughs> Rocky, have you been to Paquito Mas? That's my favorite place. Uh, I don't. Where is it at now? What part of town? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's all over the it's all over L.A. and the Valley, but uh, you know, there's one in there's one in Sherman Oaks, there's one in Encino, there's one in Woodland Hills. There's, I think, there's still oh, one in, in L.A. Um, Did you say so, it's Paquito Moss? Paquito Moss, yeah. Paquito Moss. Paquito Moss. A little more, yeah. A more, yeah. Well, Dwight, uh, Dwight the, just uh, chimed in and said Twilly loves tacos and rockamole. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know it does. <laughs> And Twilly, if he likes the Sherman Room, you know, we used to go get a steak at the Sherman Room. And where else did we used to? We used to, oh, Cupid's uh, uh, Chili John's over in North Hollywood. Have you ever been to Chili John's? No, I haven't. It's been there for 110 years. <laughs> and it's the best that. bowl of chili you're ever going to eat anywhere. And uh, Twilly no. used to get me to send him some. You know, I, I used to send it over to him frozen. <laughs> uh, there you go, Dwight. You're, I know you're watching. Your 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 frozen I, order of chilies on its way. For, for I think holiday. that's the only thing he misses. I think that's the only thing he misses about California is Chili John. <laughs> well, I'm going there. <clears throat> if I'll it's still around, there. I'm heading over there. You have to fly out. Oh, it is. It is there. It's there. David and all I right. are take you out for tacos. That's it. We're, we're I'm coming. We're going. It's all good. But hey, I, I wanted to, I wanted to talk about uh, before we get into more how how you got into 
uh, playing and such. Um, you know, we talk about how unheralded the rock and roll trio was, and that's basically because the album came out and was pretty much immediately banned all over the world. Um, yeah, they kept the real, the, the, you know, the old R and B words, and that right. didn't fly on some radio stations. So, you know, like when Elvis yeah. did "Let's Play House," you know. It, it, my dad said, I want to make love to you. He says, I want to play house with you. See, that was the difference. And that's why one of them got played on the radio and the other one didn't. You know, but the Colonel and uh, Elvis, you know. Yeah. But you know what? And to tell you the truth, and, and my dad and Dorsey and Paul, they, they'd all say, look, there was one king of rock and roll, and that was Elvis. Elvis was, Elvis was king. Right. And I loved Little Richard. I thought he was one of the great rock and roll singers of all time. But when you add it all up, you know, there was one super, super band, the Beatles, and one super, super solo artist, and that was Elvis Presley. And, uh, know, grew up. Don't get me started on little on Pat Boone's covers of Little Richard, because I'm going to throw out <laughs> oh, no, tacos right no, here. No. <laughs> fruity, all oh, Rudy. I mean, come on, Pat. Pat, Pat, Pat. <laughs> oh, Lord. I used to tease him about that. He used to go to the same church with me, and I I tease him about it. He just laughed. He's he's a good. Oh wow! Okay. <laughs> and you know, of all those guys, you know, he didn't smoke and drink. He didn't mess around. Yeah. And he's going to see his great great grandchildren one day. And I wish my you know. Yeah. I wish yeah. I could say that. Well, we all yeah we all take different roads uh, and things. Yeah. Things happen yeah, we for do. Different reasons. So. You know, we talked about this uh, a week or two ago about you know Warren Zevon saying enjoy every sandwich, and that's what uh, yeah that's that's the enjoy way. every taco that's for enjoy sure. every taco that's that's I, the, that's that's the modification I, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, you talk about Warren. You know, Warren was uh, you know I knew Warren. Uh, uh, one of our one of his kids went to school with one of the Campbell kids, and I remember the last thing he said on Letterman when he said uh, the engineer said, "Hey, why don't you come in?" Uh, take a rest and come in when you're a little bit fresher, you know, and he goes, I, this is the freshest I'm going to get, buddy. No. You know, I, he was, he was dying then. And this is all the fresh I got is what he said. This is all the fresh I got. Yeah. So he did that. And I, I'm, you know, it was a nice thing of Letterman to do. Yeah. Like, that was you wonderful. Know, like, you know, cause, uh, it, Warren was great, great piano player and a great voice. I, oh, I really man. loved him. Fantastic. But Rocky, at, at what age did you pick up the guitar, or was the guitar not your first? Or did you uh, play piano or something before that? Um, well, no, we got these uh, at Christmas. We got these little wind-up guitars. Me and Billy did, and we take the toilet plunger and we plunge them into the wooden floor, <laughs> and then we pretend like we were singing and playing these little these little guitars. <laughs> And then uh, we got uh, a couple of Gene Autry guitars at the Five and Dime. And uh, uh, then Dorsey uh, was a friend of Baker Knight and uh, 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 Al Casey, a great guitar player, Al Casey. And he said, I, I, want my, I, want, I want my boys to have some guitar lessons. Who do you recommend? And there was this guy who was teaching James Cagney. Uh, how to play Cagney was a great guitar player. Wow. But when he was making Mr. Roberts, he got in an accident and his thumb muscle disappeared. So he was seeing Burdell to find other ways to play bar chords. Wow. And we used to beg Burdell because Cagney would leave just as we would get there. We'd, we'd, we'd take a bus all the way down into Hollywood from the San Fernando Valley. And we just pleaded with him, please, can you just introduce us to, and he'd go out and walk down the back way. He didn't walk out the front way. Because he, you know, he was still one of the biggest stars of all right. time. Yeah, sure. But but uh, Dorsey made a deal with Burdell. Look, if you teach my son Billy, you got to teach Rocky too at the same time, <laughs> because they're going to be going down to Hollywood by themselves, and I want them to be with each other. They look after each other, and we were only eleven years old. <laughs> So, and we used to sit there on the corner when Joey Bishop and Regis Philbin would walk by, you know, they do their walk before they, they did their show, you know, when he was competing with Johnny Carson Yeah, yeah. and, uh, uh, you know, Wallach's music city was right on the corner. Yeah. Jay Sebring's, Jay Sebring's haircutting shop was right there between Wallach's and Burdell Mathis's, uh, little guitar teaching studio. 
And Jay Sebring was, of course, one of the, you know, yeah. the big... One of the Manson, yeah. Yeah, he used to do my dad and Dorsey's hair. He was a very nice fellow. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, everything back in Gypsy Boots would be walking down the street, you know, and we'd get a, a bag of raisins or something from him. And uh, <laughs> uh, some of the guys that made some of the big monster movies, they were working in Little Five. And, you know, it was a great place to... Oh my! Yeah. We go up, and me and Billy was, you know, we was get so excited when we get to go to the uh, to see Burdell and get our next. And first song we learned was "Cherry Pink" and "Apple Blossom Time," and uh, wow. it didn't last long. We we I think we took. Didn't Pat Boone do a cover of that? It sounds like something he would have done. <laughs> yeah, "Cherry Blossom." Well, it's just you know, it was just a Hollywood was really a, a great place then you know it was uh i don't get down there much anymore so i really can't but all the great studios you know from wally hyders to the sound factory to western gold star you know all of these places where you could walk in at any time and the would be in one room and uh uh steely dan would be in another and the doobie brothers would be in another one wow. you know it's amazing are, i'm, I'm you know. jealous <laughs> It was a great time. A great time. Well, Rocky, when uh, when when did you uh, form your first band, so to speak? Were you a were you a high school kind of guy uh, forming forming stuff, or 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 how did your music evolve? I met up with a friend of mine uh, in junior high school called Tim Sullivan, and he could sing the high part like Phil Everly, right. and I do the middle part, and we did a couple of sock hops where we did Everly Brothers tunes. And then he had a band and we started working together and doing those things in junior high school. But mostly what I did was when I got to high school, I was in a lot of the big uh, musicals. Ah, okay. Wizard of Oz and I played Conrad Birdie and Bye Bye Birdie. And meanwhile, Billy was driving over to Sun Valley and working with Delaney Bramlett. Right. From Delaney and Bonnie and, 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 and that, he was writing songs with him and Billy had a band going. Uh, and then just out of high school, he got together with Gary Busey and a, a few other folks and they started a band called Jawbone. And uh, we just kind of took it from there. And, uh, you know, a couple of years later, we're, uh, we're both uh, going for different deals at different studios and yeah. we, we land one and Billy had had, Billy had been cutting records since he was seven years old. He toured with Brenda Lee when he was nine years old. Wow. I did not know that. And he was, uh, he, him and Dorsey, I mean, they went in and cut Christmas songs. They went in and cut records. Brenda Lee loved him. Uh, Dub Albright and Brenda's manager uh, loved Billy, and that was going to be his next child star. Oh, wow. So he toured Japan and, uh, the Asia, uh, you know, uh, all, all throughout the world. And, uh, so I remember being at the Coconut Grove when they were rehearsing for the show to go over to Japan. And Billy had just, that's when you had to take this litany of shots to go overseas, <laughs> especially to Asia. Right. And Billy was so, Billy was so sick. And Dub was worried. He says, is he going to be able to go? And he, and Brenda said, don't worry, he'll be okay. And you talk about a dynamic performer. And I mean, she was only a few years older than me and Billy, but she was like an adult, you know, she yeah. was, uh, and she had thoughts, you know, when she got up and sang, man, she didn't even need a microphone. She was wow, incredible, an incredible lady too. But, um, Rocky, did you know Wanda Jackson? She's like my rock. Yes. Girl. Absolutely. In fact, uh, the last time I saw Wanda was in, um, was in, uh, I believe it was Jackson. And uh, she said, where's Johnny's boy? I want to see Johnny's boy. So I went up to her and she looked at me and she put her finger right on my chest and started thumping my chest. And she, she say, if you tell anybody what I look like without my makeup, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> 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 but I did, I did a bunch of gigs. I did a bunch of gigs with Wanda. Yeah, I went through, you know, she was, she was kind of like Brenda Lee before Brenda Lee. Yeah. She had that same voice and, you know, uh, you know, uh, what is it? Hiroshima mama or whatever it is. Oh uh, yeah. Yokohama. Uh, you know, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Fujiyama mama. My Fujiyama brother's in the background. Mama. He straightens, 
he straightens me out on all this stuff because he knows it better than I do. <laughs> Who's that in the background? So, yeah, but uh, my brother, my brother, Randy. Hey, hello. Nice, nice to see you, my friend. Randy, Mark, and David say hello, and Dwight Foley's on the line, too. Hey, Randy. Nice to meet you. We, we spent most of the show talking about tacos. <laughs> That's a fight between me and Randy. We both fight who makes better tacos, me or Randy. But we've eaten... Now, between the two of us, we've eaten probably a million tacos. <laughs> Let's get off the tacos. That's we've been right. on the tacos. Yeah, well, Randy we're... likes a big, Randy likes a big fat burrito. <laughs> <laughs> and I told, I, I'm going to tell him about uh, that uh, place David mentioned because Mas. Yeah, Paquito Mas. Oh, yeah. Dwight said hi, Randy. Dwight's passing on. The... Uh, Dwight Twilly just said hi, Randy. <laughs> <laughs> and I think we've right. been in the room. other room. Uh, See, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, Rocky. So how did you, how did you get your deal with EMI and why, why was it that the album came out in Australia before, before the U S mm. well, what happened was, is, uh, I met this young guy, Bert Berman, and he was working during the summer at Essex publishing house in England. Meanwhile, we used to work at this place called the Sundance Saloon, and that's where I met a guy named Bill House. Okay. And Bill was like working on everybody's songs from uh, The Contours to Little Richard to David Cassidy, mm. you know. And uh, uh, Bill and his brother Stan, they take me over to people's houses. Like, I mean, one day they took me over to meet uh, Barry Mann and Cynthia Wilde. Wow. And mm. you're talking about two of the biggest songwriters of all time. Right. Yeah. And I came to the door and they said, we want, and Barry was just so nice. He goes, you know, your dad cut one of my songs when I was really young and he kind of kept me going. He kept me in the business. It was called, I want to thank your folks. Mm. And it's a great song. And it sounds like a hit today. It sounds like it should have been a hit back then, uh, but it wasn't. So they'd have me over for lunch. They'd, they'd show me how they, they worked and what they did. And then they said, you, you know, you got to stay up on what's going on. So you got to listen to the radio. You got to figure out what's going on. And, you know, and, and they were playing songs like Here You Come Again. But, I mean, they were, they were like on the boardwalk and who put the bop in the box? You know, <laughs> uh, Cynthia used to say Carol King and Jerry Goffin were Lucy and Desi and they were Fred Nethel. <laughs> and they were like, they were like so kind, so kind to me. And I, you know, I'm like a, a, an 18 year old kid and I'm, you know, and they're just being so nice. And anyway, um, somebody needs to do a box set on them and call it. I now pronounce you man and wild. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. And, and you know what? He was, the only thing I worried about him was because he just, he smoked one cigarette after another. Uh. And his, like, his fingers were like brown, but he, he couldn't stop. And unfortunately, back then, I, well, I didn't actually start smoking until I was almost 30. Uh, okay. But that's why, that's why I'm on the lung machine now. It's because of my, my cigarette smoking. Yeah. But he was such a nice guy. But, man, the guy, you know, some of these guys, Neil Diamond could smoke. I never, you know, I couldn't believe how much they could smoke. <laughs> but, you know, um, the one person that just always used to try to, that really cared about me was, you know, my mom worked for Glenn Campbell for 30 years. Wow. Yeah. After, after my dad died, you know, my dad played with him in New Mexico and talked him into coming out to California. And in the process, he got a divorce from his first wife and uh, finally came out. He had met this girl uh, that cut his hair, Billy Nunley, and uh, they got married. And they came out and they stayed with us for the first couple of weeks. And Billy had gotten pregnant with Kelly. And uh, we were looking for a place, and my dad got Glenn a job right away with, with the Champs uh -huh. and playing tequila because the guitar player kind of <laughs> went haywire on. And, you know, the Champs would later become Seals and Cross. Yeah. Yeah. So, but, but, uh, but that paid the bills for uh, Billy and Glenn for a while. And then people started listening to give Glenn play. And, you know, the happiest time I ever saw Glenn was when he was a session picker, living in L.A., getting ready, getting able to golf whenever he wanted to, and the pressure wasn't on him to constantly be going places and doing stuff. Yeah, yeah. that's when Glenn was the happiest. Uh, and, yeah, uh, doing some of the bright, the Beach Boys stuff, I, I assume. Well, he did the Beach Boys, but I mean, he played on everything from Simon and Garfunkel's uh, 
uh, Bridge Over Troubled Waters to I Am a Rock. You know, that's all Glenn playing that stuff. And uh, every star from Frank Sinatra to Dean Martin to some of the big bands, you know, uh, I mean, some of the big rock and roll bands at the time. Glenn could play anything. And he he had perfect pitch. He was uh, the one thing I, I used to say, you know, I said, Glenn, Try a little kindness in these other songs you've written. Those are good songs. Nah, you know, he, he just didn't think he was that good of a songwriter, but he was. Oh, yeah. Was, there, was, there was nothing that he couldn't do. And he was really, you know, he was so kind to my mom. And uh, he, he he knew, him and Billy knew my mom was struggling. So uh, he called her up one day and said, Thoroughly, I'm getting ready to start this show for the, for Tommy Smothers and the Smothers Brothers. You know as much about the music business as anybody. Can you come and kind of secretary it out for me and everything? She said, sure. And my mom got to go all around the world, and uh, Billy became her best friend. Of course, she, you know, she'd know three or four more wives before it was over, but uh, she loved them all, you know, and she she did everything from uh, do his payroll to taking care of his kids, you know. Well, how did Some of them know? resented it years later, but... Uh, not to interrupt, but uh, I, I guess I never did get an answer to my question of how you got signed and, and how you were big in Australia first. Oh, yes. Okay, so anyway, here I am. I've got Bill House on one side and and, uh, and uh, uh, Bert Berman over in England. And Bert says, he, 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 he tells Billy, he goes, we want you to come over here and do an album. And David, the guy that owned the publishing company, along with Howie, Howie Richmond, he said, and you can, they want you to produce anybody that you want. So Bill said, I want to produce Rocky Burnett. By then, Tim and I had split up, and Tim had, had a bad marriage, went back to Arkansas. So me and Bill went into the studio, and we cut two songs. We cut Clowns in Outer Space and Shake. And uh, Dave, uh, uh, Ben Edmonds, Dave Edmonds, Ben Edmonds heard it at EMI over in England. He was the A&R guy over in England. And he says, I love this song. He says, send Rocky back the money, some money, and let's cut a B-side. So we cut a B-side, and one of those two songs was Tired of Toe on the Line. So Ben Edmonds has a dream, and he says, the B-side's going to be the A-side. They release it in England, and it goes right up the charts. And then it hits in Sweden and becomes a number one record there. And then... Ricky Nelson records it. He doesn't even know any of this is going on in Europe. Mm -hmm. And Ricky Nelson records Tired of Toe on the Line. And uh, a friend of mine and uh, um, James Enfield's brother uh, says, well, Rocky's got that song out overseas right now. And Ricky, who had a lot more clout than I had, you know, mm -hmm. he said, well, let Rocky have his chance with the record here. And if it doesn't work out, we'll release it. But it's on a lot of uh, Ricky's uh, reissues. Yeah. But, uh, you know, because my dad and Dorsey wrote 25 different songs for Ricky. Right, right. You know, not just the hits, Believe What You Say, and It's Late and Waiting in School, but, man, Gypsy Woman. And it, it, I mean, just a little too much. And the list goes on and on. He loved them. But uh, so Ben Edmonds would get signed to the EMI over in England. Now, the guys here... Uh, Mazza and Gerson and all the guys that were running it here, you know, they were knee deep in Kenny Rogers records and Kim Karn stuff, you know, yeah. and they had the Jay Giles band. Yeah. So they were kind of forced to release my record, but Mark Parento and Oedipus and a lot of the guys at WBCN on the East coast said, man, we love this record. And they started playing it and it immediately started going up the charts. And I remember uh, uh, everybody in England says, you got to go back, you got to go back to LA because they're playing your record there. And me and my manager, my road manager, Jimmy Sider at the time, we get out of the car. I mean, we get off of the plane and, uh, EMI sent a limo to pick me up, you know, yeah. and I really wasn't used to that, <laughs> but the radio's on and it's on KHJ and they're playing car to toe on the line. And I went, Oh my God. And as soon as it was over on KHJ, uh, Jimmy turned it to KRLA, and they were playing it on KRLA. And wow. then we turned it on to Kiss, and they were playing it on Kiss. And I go, Jimmy, 
we got us a hit record. <laughs> and uh, Dw- then the Dwight just mentioned from Gary, Gary Gershwin. Was, uh... Yeah, uh, 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 yeah, Gary Gersh. Gersh. Yeah. Gary Gersh, yeah. He became the, uh, after Mazza left, he became the president over there. Then he was the president of Capitol. But, uh, yeah, so, he was one of the guys. I, I think he had something to do with uh, signing Dwight. But that's where I met Dwight, you know, back uh, back in the, you know, early, you know, kind of, well, 76, 77. And, you know, Dwight's been like, you know what? I've had a lot of friends in my life. and I've been really blessed with a great family and a lot of friends. But Dwight and I, and I, man, I don't want to get emotional about this, but I, I love him so much. We have never so much just had a cross word with each other. We've given each other advice before. And we said, well, maybe this or maybe that. But he's the only person in the history of my life that I've never gotten into it with. Because I get into it with everybody sooner or later. <laughs> Dwight, he's been, like my, he's been like my best friend through everything, the good days and the bad days. and, and he's, uh, he's commenting. Uh, I love him. He's commenting I love him. in the he's, affirmative. Yeah, yeah, he's great. Well, he's I love him. He's, he's my favorite songwriter. When I when when I listen to records, I pull out my Beatles, my Elvis, uh, Roy Orbison, my Dwight Twillies, and uh, Steve Winwoods. Oh wow! And uh, you know, uh, I love Patsy Cline. You know, there's a lot of uh, a lot of the girls I really like, but uh, uh, but no, but, uh, but Cl- I'm on fire. It's like one of the greatest rock and roll records ever made. Yeah. And uh, I, I listen to that like every other day. Wow. Yeah. Clowns from Outer Space. Why? 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 Okay, that was going to be the, the A side, correct? Dw- Dwight just yeah. said, love you too. He, he's, he's commenting. Um, why, yeah. why, why was it not called All Your Love Is Gone? <laughs> you know what? We figured. We were, we were having trouble. I wrote that with uh, Ron Coleman. We were having trouble going back and forth to, from Nashville. And all of a sudden, we'd start hearing some of our lines in some of these songs. So we thought we'd do something really obscure, you know? Yeah. And make it... We, we, it, it was originally written as kind of a reggae song. And uh, yeah. we had the clowns in outer space that says, nobody's going to have that with a, with a right brain is going to try to copy this, you know? <laughs> but... Two years later, they make a movie called Clowns in Outer Space. And I'm going, oh, my God. at least they could have used our song. Yeah. Well, and, and speaking of the song, here's just a couple seconds, just so people can know. That's a that's a driving sing along song if I ever heard it right there. Oh man, that's Bill House. You know he could, <laughs> he was a great producer. He still is. We just got offered a, a deal, so we're gonna. I just took him some songs the other day, and if I can hang around long enough, we're gonna we're gonna cut another record. Which uh, oh, that's wonderful news. Yeah, I remember talking to uh, Jim Steinman, and he was really upset that he, I mean really excited that he was gonna get to work with Meatloaf again, mm-hmm. and then then Jim died, and then. And yeah. Meatloaf died, but uh, well, just it, could you, in your wildest dreams, Rocky, did you think when you wrote "Tired of Toe in the Line" when you recorded it, did you think it was going to be the the sensation that it was? No, you know. And Cal Rudman said something to me once. He oh, said, "Cal's a good friend of mine, right down the street from where I live, right here." Go ahead. Well, he said to me, "Once a star, always a threat," and a hit sounds more like a hit after it's a hit. <laughs> He's right about that. And I've, never, I, 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 I've never forgotten that, that and I've never like forgotten that. it. Actually, it wasn't one of what it wasn't what I thought was one of my better songs, but it had that little thing going, and and really, it was a better production mm-hmm. than it was actually a, a great song. It was a it was the production that Bill House laid on that thing is what really made it. And he went on to produce, you know, uh, some good good folks, but. Uh, Doggone it! He should have been. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He, he should have been a major major producer. But we're gonna we're gonna work together again, and he's still out there playing. And you know, I, I can it, I it can ain't remember, over. I can remember tired the tone of line 
Yeah, it was my senior year of high school when that came out. Uh, and it really, really hit big in the summer of 1980. Because uh, I guess it, yeah. was, it was released maybe in May. And man, all summer long at, at the at the swimming pool, the speakers would just keep blaring, tired of toe in the line. And it was just ingrained in me from that moment <laughs> on. And I, I wore out. It was a lot of fun. I wore out two copies of, of that album. And just so people know, by the way, because we're getting into that at some point, uh, Icono Classic Records just released Son of Rock and Roll. First and here time. it is. I'm and holding it. I'm as holding it up right now on the screen for everybody to see. But first, first time, time on CD. First time first on time. CD. I'm going to put the banner up to IconoClassicRecords.com. And, of course, you can get it at Amazon and all the usual places. But uh, it's it's remastered. It's got a couple bonus tracks on it. And it, it, it sounds incredible. And yeah. not, number one, it t- takes you right back. Takes you right back. And number two. And it, I it, like yeah. the mastering. Whoever mastered it did, did a good job because it sounds control. really good to me. It, I mean, what's I really, the, what's I really the name of the head honcho at Iconoclasa? Uh, the head honcho? Well, I know that, uh, I, I know that, uh, uh, I forget his name. Um, he was nice enough to send me some extra records the other day, but uh, um, yeah, I, thought, uh, I, I had it. I had was it, it. Is his name Frank by chance? I don't know why that rings a bell, but I could be wrong. I just I, I found out not too long ago that uh, you know because I did this Americana Railroad uh, album, right? Yeah, and I did an album a few years ago on songs that Pat Robinson and I, I I wrote, and. Uh, 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 Saul Davis and his beautiful wife. I, I, you know, they, 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 they had, they, they, they've been. Oh, wait, there it uh, is, Jeremy. Know. Oh, Jeremy, Jeremy. I, um, which Jeremy. is also my brother's name. Uh, I want to thank you for all the releases that you've done. Um, I uh, especially love the uh, Guess Who re- reissues and Burton Cummings and all that stuff. So thank you, and of course for Son of Rock and Roll. Yeah, so, is Jeremy on there now? Yeah, Rock, Rocky, because uh, Rocky's only on my phone. He can't see the, uh, qu- the the comments coming up. But Jeremy is on here right now, and he he just jumped Jeremy, in. Jeremy, thank you. You did an excellent record. I That's my favorite album cover. Uh, I love the mastering that you did. Thank you for sending me the extra records. Uh, and, uh, yeah, yeah, God bless you, man. 42 years. I finally get it out on CD. <laughs> well, Jeremy just said you're very welcome. Great stuff. So, uh, well, thank you, for, thank you very much, Jeremy. Well, Jeremy, hopefully- I need, Jeremy, I need to talk to you about some other reissues that I would love to see come out. So <laughs> maybe, maybe we can meet in Los Angeles and have a taco. Well, yes. <laughs> Heck yeah. Well, real, real quick, we're talking toe in the line, so I got to get this in. That's brand new on Icono Classic Records, uh, Son of Rock and Roll from Rocky Burnett. First time in 42 years, worldwide release on CD, remastered. So, Icono Classic Records. It's hard to believe it's been that long. Unbelievable. Hard to believe it's been that long. But the whole album, oh, Jeremy says he likes tacos. There you go. (laughs) Good. Thanks, Jeremy. Oh, Nick Robbins did a great remaster. So, we get, get... Get a shout out to uh, Nick and well, it was great. And Dwight, great. Dwight Twilley just chimed in because Iconic Classic also released Wild Dogs. Indeed, That's they awesome. did, and I have that too. But I don't. Um, know. Oh, yeah. One of my favorites. One of my favorites. I love it. This is a- oh, Carrie. It's like one of my all-time favorite Dwight songs. I mean, oh, wow. uh, you know, there's a there's a face that I've seen before, like the smile on a child in a candy store. I mean, that's poetry. Yeah. See. That's poetry, and he, you know what he taught me? He taught me, yeah, you can have words, but start to mix them up and juggle them around and and, and, and sweat over those. Get the right word for the right place. Yeah. And I've become a better songwriter because, in fact, I'm a much better songwriter today than I was then. And a lot of it has to do with, because I've got to write with, you know, Steve Cropper, uh, Dwight Twilley, uh, Mentor Williams, Paul Williams' brother that wrote Drift Away. Yeah. 
you know what? I, and I feel bad, you know, because I got to I got to write a song with Johnny Symbol, who sang Mr. Bassman. Oh yeah, yeah, wow. You know, David Malloy, my cousin Billy. My cousin Billy's been recorded. His songs have been recorded by everybody, and uh, uh, it's just been it's it's been a great life. You know, I I've got no complaints. I wish I'd have taken a little bit better care of myself, but. Uh, right now, you know, if I could get on a plane right now, they just offered me like $30,000 for six weeks in Australia, and they put half the money in my bank account. Oh. And I can't get on I can't get on an airplane. Oh. Oh. Will that, could that situation change? <laughs> no, no. If I took a ship down there, I'd be... I'd be dead before I landed in Australia, <laughs> but, uh, no, I can't, I can't get on a plane. My, yeah. my lungs are so bad are just, you know, uh, I've been on, I've been on a lung machine. I've been on a, a oxygen machine now for five years wow. and I was able to put the air machine on the side of the stage and go out there and I could just go back and get a little bit of every now and then. But, uh, the last, uh, one of the last gigs I did was Vegas and I knew that. And I, I always told myself if I couldn't get it out there and belt it out, cause that's what you got to, cause most of my life has been spent doing my dad's music, not my music. Right. Right. And I've had other hits by other artists, Percy Sledge and the contours and people like that. But I've had other hits of my own, like in Australia, Europe, you know, unfortunately in, it, in, in in the United States, I had toe on the line, and then the record company started having trouble, and I didn't have the right management. And uh, anyway, ev eventually EMI would go well, that, under. That's kind of my my follow up question. That is because you had a number eight hit in the U.S. You had a number one in Australia. You had top hits. You know, the tired toe on the line was huge in many areas, and then. You fo the follow up album Heartstopper is on some label called The Goods, and it's, it's yeah. Now, see, see, that was supposed to be that was supposed to be MCA, MCA, MCA bought it, but I was in business back then with a group called Music Vision, and they actually they lied to me. They said it was going to come out on MCA. I get a copy of the record, and it says The Goods, hmm. and. Basically, I think they just used it as kind of like a tax write-off. And I thought they were my friends, you know, Dennis Laventhal and, and those guys. And years later, you know, John Scott would say, no, they they didn't do what they were supposed to do. But, you yeah. know, hey, uh, I wrote Heartstopper with Moon Martin, and yep. uh, Moon and I had been friends for years. And uh, uh, Such a good it, was a, it was a great record to do with Bill. And that, that record is still sitting on the shelf somewhere. And it's just as good as the Son of Rock and Roll record. I'm telling you, I love it. I, I got it. Well, I actually got it in the mail and then turned around and sent it to you to, for you to sign for me. But <laughs> I'm, I'm going to go over to Amoeba Records in L.A. and find a copy. <laughs> it is it is such a good, such a good album. And I was just like, you know, after having a, such a monster hit, this this next album, it's, it's almost like they just said, you know, we don't care what the follow it, what whatever it's happened. It's really weird. Really weird. Back then, back then, you know, if you had a certainly if you had a top ten hit, you got another album on a big label. I mean, you know, yeah, yeah, you, 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 yeah you'd think so, but on the other hand, you know, it wasn't all their fault. I, uh, you know, un, you know, oh, I had the success awesome. thing going. I was going around the world. I was touring with Fleetwood Mac. Uh, my childhood sweetheart walks back into my life and I get married and I thought that, well, in between the two albums, I could just kind of take a breather. But once see, I had a, I had a crew. I had a, I had a, I had a band. I had a big band. I had, uh, all this thing set up and all of a sudden mm. young musicians that used to work for me out at the Sundance saloon for $20 a night were saying, Hey man, we need a couple of grand, you know, and, uh, it just, the whole dynamic thing changed. So what I did was Paul Burleson called me up and said, Rocky, I just got offered a deal to go over to England and do some of these rockabilly festivals. And I said, some of the what? And he says, these rockabilly festivals.
up all over the world. And I said, really? They want us to come over there? He goes, yeah, but you're going to have to cut your hair. And of course, my, my hair was so long. My hair was so long, I used to have to part it to go to the bathroom. <laughs> but but we we picked up, you know, uh, Johnny Black, Bill Black's brother, yeah. a little guy named Bobby Duke, and uh, who was a nightmare. And uh, uh, I'm trying to remember. Uh, uh, we had another. Uh, oh, Tony Austin. Uh, he he played drums. So, uh, and he played drums for the rock and roll trio. So we go over to this rockabilly festival and it's pandemonium, man. I couldn't believe it. It's like 1500 kids tearing off. They tore off my jacket. I made the mistake of saying this was one of my dad's last jackets. And it was like this hazy thing. And they just, I still got people sending me pieces of that jacket. (laughs) I want you to sign it, sign it and send it back to them. So we started, we started doing, we started doing rockabilly festivals and these little Lipinski uh, shows and stuff like that. And we worked for the next 25 years playing all over the world, all over the world to standing room only crowds. So when people say, what happened to you? What did, well, I, I got to go back to my main love. See me and Billy somewhere in the late sixties, early seventies, we were trying to tell people about rockabilly music, about this music that our dads made. And they said, that's old hat. That'll never come around. Meanwhile, guys like Robert Gordon and Ray Campion like that, they were listening. And uh, Brian Setzer and the Stray Cats, they were listening. So by the time we gave up and started recording our own music, all of a sudden these guys start becoming with the rockabilly thing. And we're going, "My, my gosh. So we get everybody together in Memphis, everybody that's left from, uh, Roland James to Scotty Moore to, you know, anybody that was around. And we went in and started cutting rockabilly records at Sun Studios with Roland James and Stan wow. Kessler. Wow. I mean, all the great guys, man. And uh, that's what we did for the next, I've got 20, uh, 15 or 20 albums, just rockabilly records. Oh, yeah. I've done a few yeah. with Daryl Hyam. I've done a few with, uh, you know, I did three or four with Paul. I did some, uh, I did several with, uh, a group over in Holland, a bunch of kids that I really love working with. Uh, Zeke Zarin Gable, a guy that I play with a lot here. We, wow. we cut a bunch of stuff. So I never stopped working, and I never stopped writing. And you know what? The pressure was off me. I had so much fun at these rockabilly festivals, and people would come up to me from Russia, from uh, China, and they'd have big tattoos of the rock and roll trio on their back. I signed... <laughs> I must have signed two. I must have signed two hundred female butts with my dad's name on their nice. back. <laughs> you think I didn't have any fun? <laughs> oh no, we didn't think that. <laughs> oh man. Uh, well, you know, and, and you t- you keep talking about rock rockabilly, and of course, your name is Rocky, and your your uh, cousin's name is Billy, um, which I always thought was. Was real was real funny coincidence, uh, so to speak. But yeah, um, it's a funny coincidence. Uh, funny the other thing is too is uh, they they uh, my dad and Dorsey were really proud of us. We were uh, uh, my dad was nineteen when I was born, you know, and uh, God, he was still. I think about when I was nineteen, you know. I can't I can't even imagine having a, a child, and yeah. especially yeah. around Memphis, and you're knocking around and you're trying to get a career going and all of this stuff, but. Uh, but you didn't answer the big question, though. You didn't answer the big question. Did you have to cut your hair, or to quote signs, did you put your hair up under your hat? <laughs> no, no, I, uh, uh, I cut it. Right. I cut it, and I, uh, and Paul did the pompadour thing for me. You know, oh, I had so much Aquanet. I had so much Aquanet in my hair. I was afraid to get close to the, the, the rockabilly fans were always smoking back then, you know, you walked out on stage and it was just one big fog of smoke and they don't even allow that anymore. But yeah. there was so much, well, we, I worked in so many smoky arenas or auditoriums doing the rockabilly thing, but, uh, that can't be good I, I worked for some, uh, like Richie G in England and, uh, Johnny Seinberg and, uh, Bo Berglund, I worked for these guys like 15 and 20 times. They, they, they'd hire me back every other year, you know, and we'd get together a little tour and we'd go do that. And then there were places around here I'd play. And, 
Well, what are your uh, what are so, your thoughts, Rocky? On uh, I just watched it the other day, the uh, Raised on Rock, the Sally Steele documentary, the Burnett Brothers uh, story, uh, which is well, which is I love on, Sally, and it's now out on Amazon you know, and YouTube and uh, things for a for a small rental. I, I highly suggest people watching it if they if they love it. But uh, what are your feelings on on the documentary? Well, I love Sally. First of all, Sally's. Uh, been a great friend of mine and when i met her in las vegas i was doing the rockabilly show of my dad's with daryl hyam and she she had been in japan years before and toe in the line was the song that reminded her of home mm. so she came out to see me sally Steele runs a uh, uh a magazine in in las vegas called vegas rocks and she's been doing it for like 20 years and everybody knows her everybody loves her but uh she came backstage to pick a fight with me. She was really upset that I didn't do tired of toe on the line. Right, right. Huh. I grabbed the guitar. I grabbed the guitar and I said, look, we've got to go out front and do some autographs. I'll sing toe on the line to you out front. So I took my guitar and we went out front and there was this big line of people, you know, and all the acts that had performed, you know, we're doing the, you know, the autograph thing. And we started singing songs. And by then there were more people in the hallway <laughs> singing, singing our songs. You know, we did toe on the line and we did, you know, hey baby, and oh, just a bunch of songs, you know. And I shook hands with her, and I said, it was an old line that I used to use all the time. In fact, Carl Perkins, he said, I feel the electricity, son. Well, I, I shook hands with her, and I said, Sally, I feel the electricity. And she believed me. <laughs> she actually believed. She actually believed me. So we, we got to be friends, and uh, Actually, we were girlfriend and boyfriend for a while, but that's what she was—a woman in love. Then, okay, a woman in love. Well, she was, she was, <laughs> and she was, and I told her, I said, "Look, uh, people haven't had a whole lot of, you know, if you're going to do a, a thing." I, I told her about how, you know, if you go back when my, when my dad and Dorsey signed the deal with Coral Records, they had a chance to go with Capitol Records. Mm-hmm. But Coral was offering some front money, and they needed the money. Yeah, yeah. So they told Capital, they said, hey, we can't do it, but we got a good friend of ours that can. His name's Gene Vincent. Mm-hmm. So Gene got the gig over at Capital and sang Bebop Alula. <laughs> they ended up with it before my dad did. <laughs> my, my, my uncle was instrumental in discovering little Stevie Wonder on the Santa Monica Pier. Really? Yeah. <laughs> took, him, took him to Motown and never got a bit of credit for it. But if you look... At uh, Little Stevie Wonder's first album, you'll see Dorsey Burnett songs on there. Ah, all right. And then Dorsey recorded, Dorsey recorded for a Motown subsidiary. I, I it might have been Melody Land or one of those things. And they thought Dorsey was black. See? Yeah. Okay. They didn't realize till later. Hey, this is white guy. <laughs> and Dorsey had an R and B voice. My dad had a rock and roll voice, but Dorsey, as Dorsey had one of the greatest voices of all time. Wow! wow. And he could sing R and B music. I mean, his great shake and fever. And uh, if you listen to the early Dot and the early Era records, man, it, 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 he was Elvis's favorite singer, mm. above Roy Orbison and everybody else. Dorsey Burnett. Wow! Wow! I'll never forget Charlie Underwood. Charlie Underwood, who used to be an engineer at Sun, was doing a record on Roy Orbison. And Roy said, hey, Charlie, do you know the Burnett Brothers? I'd sure like to meet them. And he goes, sure I do, man. They're over doing a little gig over at the Peabody Hotel right now. And he goes, well, well let's go. Can you introduce me to him? He goes, sure. So they walked into the Peabody Hotel, and they pushed the elevator button. And the elevator button opened up and it was my dad and Dorsey on the ground fighting with each other. (laughs) So everything that they had heard was true, but they took Roy out for a drink and, uh, uh, well, boy, they loved Roy Oberson. They thought he was one of the great singers. And he was, he was one of the great. Yeah. Now you, now your, your dad and uh, your uncle Dorsey, their relationship as far as just, you know, how they could fight was kind of legendary and, and not get along. Um, but when I watched, you know, when I watched the raised on rock, um, you've had, you've had a, you grew up with Billy and you were very tight, but you had some, some, uh, disagreements, shall we say over the years and your relationship has, 
has kind of, you know, run, run its waves as well. What, what is that like today? You know, we never, we, we never had a bad day in our life, except when I got the EMI deal and he got the Columbia deal. And then my manager, who really, really wasn't a manager, he was a road manager. He had a smart-ass mouth, first of all. In fact, he could sit on a snow cone and tell what flavor it was. But Barry, Barry and Susie, Billy's managers, were cutthroats. You know? Yeah. They, they, they tried to undermine me in every way they could, and I told Billy, I said, Billy, there's, there's no reason for this. You know, and that's really the only bad time we ever had was during that time. Yeah. And of course, once his deal was over with them, uh, uh, they sued him. Mm-hmm. And of course, once my deal was over with Jimmy, Jimmy disappeared someplace and I haven't seen him for 10 or 15 years. But no, they caused, they caused me and Billy a lot of trouble that didn't need to be. And what, what, what should have ended up, and this is what I told Billy at the time, but he didn't want to do it. Uh, I said, N- now let's do an album together. We can do an album together, and that'll make us both, you know, they've got to play it, you mm-hmm. know? Yeah. So really to this day, the only thing me and Billy, and you can see it on YouTube, if you go and listen to uh, on Paul Burleson's album, me and Billy do Train Kept a Rollin. Right, right. And we got Jimmy, we, we got some of the best musicians in the country playing it, and it's a great version. It's, it's my favorite version, uh, besides my dad, Dorsey's, you know. Uh, you're never going to make a better record than that. But uh, right. mine, and Billy's, mine and Billy's trained Caparola, man, is rocking, and it's great. And you can hear it free of charge on YouTube, you know, right now, and it's, it's great. I'm, I'm happy there is a YouTube. But yeah. Uh, yeah. anyway... Uh, I mean, Rocky. Uh, yeah, Wilde, that was really the only problem we ever had. You really had. I mean, you've you've really had quite the rock and roll life. It, it, it's true. You're the son of rock and roll. Um, I, I just, I just personally, as I've gotten to know you over the last couple of weeks, talking to you and things, uh, you know, I, it's a thrill to be sitting here talking with you right now. Um, that song tired of talking. Well, it's line. my pleasure, Mark. It's my yeah. pleasure, Mark. It's a thrill for me too to speak with you after tw- uh, twenty-three years have gone by, and um, yeah. yeah, that song, that that song, uh, definitely will be wedged in my memory of ni- of nineteen eighty and beyond forever. Yeah, and we uh, we absolutely yeah. wish wish you the best uh, health wise, Rocky. Uh, absolutely, and, and, and I hope you get a chance to. Uh, do another recording because um, you just deserve it. You, you, you should do that. If well, it's thank possible. you, man. And, and I tell you, it's, it's it, you know, it's guys like you and and David and, and Jeremy and and, and Twileximo and mm-hmm. I'm sure Jan's out there someplace. And, <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. You know, uh, Carla. You know, Carla. Uh, she's uh, she's got diabetes too, and she's mm-hmm. helped me out. That's Saul's wife. And she helps me out with my, my diabetes when I really have. The other night, I was just, for some reason or other, man, I'd got down to like 25 on my blood sugar thing. Wow. And, you know, that's almost Comaville. Yeah, yeah. So I was able to pull it out, but I'm still trying to get over that. But, you know, I just tell, I try to tell people, you know, don't smoke. And, man, I was a Coca-Cola fiend. I love oh. Coca-Cola. And I'm talking oh about God. the drink milk. I had to have a Coke wherever I went. And, uh, you know, I just didn't take care of myself. That's all. For me, it's diet soda. I'm, I'm an addict. I'm actually holding up a can of uh, Mountain, <laughs> Mountain Dew Spark, right? Uh, zero, zero calories. So, um, If I go a whole week, if I go a whole week, I'll have one of those little tiny airline cans of Coca-Cola. Right, right. Hmm. <laughs> and get my blood sugar get my blood sugar back up but that's the only time i splurge anymore you know yeah i'm, I'm, I'm with you you gotta well i i hope to have a taco with you one day yeah um however oh, yeah. You need I, to do. I, I hope so well once again if, i want to not hear the streets of glory <laughs> the streets of glory. right i want to <laughs> remind everybody iconoclassicrecords.com um and of course all the usual places amazon uh, online uh, uh, distributors, the son of rock and roll, Rocky Burnett, first time on CD in 42 years. 
Uh, of course, Dwight Tooley's on the line uh, with us uh, as well, and his uh, uh, his Wild Dogs uh, CD is out on Iconic Classic as well. But um, Rocky, we're, we're we're going to let you go. I know it's uh, we're well past our hour time. But I just want to say I appreciate the, the time and, and talking with you. Yeah, as do I. Thank you. And God bless you, my friend. Hey, God bless you guys. My mom thanks you. My dad thanks you. My little brother thanks you. <laughs> and I thank you. God bless both of you. And Jeremy God and bless Dwight, you too. Best of luck. Yeah, this was been a, it's been a fun one. Thank you. Very good. good. Robin, Robin uh, and Jeremy, uh, they've all been checking in right here saying great show and wonderful Wonderful interview. So anybody can watch this on archives on Facebook and on YouTube and the audio only on materialissues.podbean.com. It'll be out there uh, for eternity. So uh, Rocky, I'm going to let you go. I'm going to hang up. Uh, I'm, I'm going to give you a call after our show ends here uh, in a few minutes uh, just to just to sign off officially after David and I go through our things here. But God bless you, my friend. God bless you guys, both of you. Right. Thank we'll you so much. We'll talk to you soon. Rocky. Hope to see you both. Indeed. Thank you. Talk you to see me one way or the other. <laughs> okay. All right. Love you, Rockman. Love you too, Mark. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye, David. Bye. Well, there you have it, David. Yeah, that was uh, that was a wonderful interview. And thank you, as, Dwight. As Dwight Twilley said, fucking great interview. Indeed it was. <laughs> and, and Dwight, thank you for being here. And, and yeah, thank you uh, for hanging out, Dwight. We appreciate it. Uh, and, I, and I know Rocky uh, really appreciate it as well. So um, that, that made it wonderful. I mean, that's just, um, you know, there's a number, we've talked about this before. There's a number of iconic tunes in my life and, of course, in your life. And we've talked about Henry Gross and Shannon and whatnot. But I will always remember the summer of 1980 at the uh, Kutztown Swimming Pool hmm. when I first heard, Baby, I and it has never left my head yeah and uh i was in college i i i can't say i have an exact memory of when i first heard it but um yeah it was, yeah. It, it, was it, it, it hit i mean right away it was like what the hell is this this is so unusual for the for this time and it's so good and it was it, it was what was so interesting is i was a rockabilly fan back then you know i was uh just really getting into rockabilly and you know a couple years later i was playing in my own rockabilly band um but you know finding out that rocky burnett his dad was then johnny burnett of the rock and roll trio and then i ended up you know taking paul burleson music fest from the airport to his hotel and from the hotel to wow. music fest in Allen, oh, wow. sat in his hotel room while he showed me just some licks to like tear it up and eager beaver baby and some of those things like that so that i talked to rocky about that uh, a couple of weeks ago my little uh, claim, claim or, or six degrees of separation to Rocky was uh, Paul Burleson, but um, yeah, amazing stuff, and 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 really wish Rocky the best. I know he's uh, he's uh, traveling a hard road right now physically, but yeah. uh, but yeah, you know, but thank God he's he's still around, and and thank God he you know, get got to see the CD released uh, all over the world now in Iconoclast. Right. So great, Absolutely. great stuff, Jeremy. Thank you so much for putting it out. Yeah, really good indeed but uh we've got we've got some things going on here for the holiday season don't we david indeed we do we've got uh three guests uh, scheduled for the next three weeks um next week we have the great songwriter uh also from te uh, originally and still from tennessee uh in this case nashville uh, mr bergen white and uh you know, one of the great stories, of, uh, I mean, he's written lots and lots of stuff, over, uh, a lot of songs over his lifetime, but uh, writing the songs and recording them for that label, Hit Records, is is an amazing story. I, I found out about Hit uh, in uh, 1980, I believe, when my friend and I had gone to a warehouse, some warehouse in New Jersey, that had a whole bunch of records uh, uh, in boxes on the floor. And they're all, and then there were all these, you know, besides major label releases and stuff. I'm talking about seven inches, a lot of obscure soft pop and rock and roll and whatever. Um, I see this label hit records, and I see that, you know, that there are these, uh, there are these cover versions of songs that uh, were huge hits, and um, and then on the B sides, there are often songs by. Um, 
that were not big hits. And they all had really, like, uh, if, if it was a cover of She's Not There, the name of the group was The Mummies. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and uh, some of the versions, I have to say, some of the versions were, uh, you know, kind of uh, kind of mediocre. And then others were really yeah. good. <laughs> uh, but uh, the, the thing that struck the most is that I really liked the, the, the original songs that were on the B-side. And um, many of those were written or co-written by our guest next week. Uh, and um, then, of course, he's very well known in soft pop circles for his awesome album on SSS International called For Women Only. Uh, just, uh, yeah, as, as good as soft pop gets. And we're talking about Mr. Bergen White. Uh, and... Uh, He's uh, he's agreed to be our guest, and I, I had the pleasure of having dinner with him uh, about 19 years ago or, or 18 years ago in Nashville when I was doing IPO there. And he's just a great Southern gentleman, and uh, I'm really looking forward to having him on. And he just um, inducted uh, Ray Stevens in the Musicians Hall of Fame, I, I believe, right? He inducted Ray Stevens, yeah, which is one of the reasons why when he was originally scheduled, he had to postpone, but we'll have him on next week uh, on material issues. And then the following week, um, we're going to have the main man of a great power pop band. Um, and I'm trying to remember exactly which state, but they were, they were from the South. Maybe it was Louisiana. I, I don't remember, but I'll, I'll make sure I get that right. Uh, the name of the band was the criers. And this is actually a picture disc that I just picked up of their, their debut album. And it was a big, I remember, I, I don't think I'd read about them, but I was in uh, a record store uh, in, in, uh, in, what, in Brooklyn called Titus Oaks. And I saw the album and I'm looking at the cover and I'm saying, it's on Mercury Records. I had not heard of, of the band, but it looks so pop. Um, you know, the guys in front, they look like pop guys. And then you read the song titles and, you know, like shake it up and just a little rain. And I figured, and it was a promo copy for like two ninety nine. 99. I said, I have to take a chance on this. <laughs> and when I brought it home and put it on, it's like, wow, this is, this is really amazing power pop. Um, and shake it up, which never became a big hit, unfortunately, although it should have, uh, ended up being the title song of the first uh, American power pop DIY compilation that Rhino put out in 1991 that I actually had the pleasure of helping with. It was the first thank you I ever received on, on a record, and I, it <laughs> felt so good. But Gary, the late Gary Stewart and I, uh, yes, it is. Uh, we, uh, like Gary Stewart and I worked on that, and we both agreed that Shake It Up needed to be on the compilation. And uh, then they made it the title song, and I, I really should have brought one in with me not right now. I don't, uh, I have it in my rack, but well, we'll see it. We'll see it when this guest comes on. Anyway, he's the main man. I, I found him on Facebook a few years ago. We've talked a little bit over the years. His name's Lowry Hamner, and uh, what an amazing songwriter, singer, everything he is, and. Um, Choirs had two albums, but the first one is the real power pop classic. Um, so yeah, Lowry Hamner will be on next week, uh, not next week, but on the 21st. And then on the 28th, um, this ties into this new reissue, the Montanas, the complete studio session. The Montanas were a UK band who uh, put out um, some amazingly great records in the, in the, mid to late 60s and early 70s. Um, probably uh, the one that my favorite is Step in the Right Direction. It's like a perfect pop psych song. Oh, my God. But then there's You Gotta Be Loved, which was actually released in the U.S., unlike most of the others. Uh, and there were tons of amazing songs. The harmonies were all over the place. Uh, very much like, you know, very much like the uh, Poor Man's Hollies, I guess you could call them, because they didn't have hits. But right. they were almost as good in my opinion and this compilation has come out of tons of their stuff and 
one of the, I mean, their main roadie at that time was a man named John Kirby, who we've gotten to know over the years. He's yep. become a good friend. Um, he helped me a few. T I remember one time um, at, at an IPO show at Spaceland when Roger Manning uh, was pl was playing. Um, we ag we agreed beforehand. They they headlined the show, and we agreed beforehand that they could use their own gear. So we had to get our back line off the stage. And I was worried that, you know, we weren't going to get it off in time. Well, John Kirby decided to help me. And, uh, I mean, the man knew what he was doing. Let me tell you that. And we got that gear off probably with five minutes to spare, which, which was great. I mean, we got it off into our van, into my van and the whole thing. So he's, you know, he, he but he hasn't rode He's roadied for some pretty famous people, apparently, including uh, Jimi Hendrix and uh, The Move and many others. So he's got stories. Mm -hmm. uh, believe me, he's got stories. And we're going to hear a lot of them. Um, he now lives in Vegas. He's, he's a sound engineer. Um, he had he did he did do some engineering at, at IPO shows as well. I believe for the Grip Weeds in in Liverpool, uh, he'll be able to confirm that. But yeah, he's a fun guy, and uh, I mean, this is going to be like yeah, he uh, as uh, to to quote the line from uh, Californication, he was a rock and roll butler. Um, <laughs> and uh, Mr. Yep. John Kirby on December twenty eighth. He's going to finish um, up. Uh, finish up two thousand. Finish up two thousand twenty-two. Yeah. Our last show of the year, which will be show. This was 81, 82, 83. That's show number eighty-four. Our last show of the year. So that's going to be. It's going to be great. Bring in. I think we're going to have three great guests in a row, and yeah. uh, we'll have more. Of course, we'll we always have irons in the fire. We'll have stuff for the new year. Sure do. And yeah. Uh, but yeah, I'm really looking forward to all three of these, and. Uh, so yeah, so we we've got that, and uh, before we go, I just wanted to say that people need to get this, um, and my review of it should be coming coming uh, available soon. The Beach Boys Sail on Sailor in 1972, with uh, the albums Carl and the Passion, So Tough, and Holland, along with all kinds of outtakes, uh, demos. Etc., and a live show from '72, which really revealed the Beach Boys to be a great rock and roll band. I mean, this was all before the whole cockamamie Bri uh, Brian is back thing, um, yeah. <laughs> which was, which unfortunately, no, he wasn't, not uh, at least not at that point. He eventually was back, but not in 1976 when they wanted him to be. But yeah, so those were great albums. Call and the Passions is definitely one of the most underrated albums in the Beach Boys canon. Oh, um, you know, they made, uh, I, I believe Brother Records made a big mistake in releasing it in, uh, and Pet Sounds as, as a combination. Um, it, it, you know, it, it kind of sent a message that, well, you know, we know the only way you're going to buy this album is to include Pet Sounds. And that's the way it should be because this album's not all that good. Well, they were wrong. It was all that good, but just not remember too well. But this this box set will definitely a, a, a alleviate that situation. Um, so yeah, so so that and a whole bunch of other stuff I've been listening to, and I've got to work on my twenty twenty two list. So I've got a lot of stuff to listen to there, um, yep. and. Uh, Busy Remember Wire. Vera Womble. Oh, yeah. Uh, this just came Womble. out. Wow. Uh, the Womble's uh, four CD box, are all four albums. And I know a lot of people think that this is a guilty pleasure or not a pleasure at all. But let me tell you something. There, there are some amazingly hooky tunes on here. And Mike Batt was a really good guitar player and vocalist. And... Uh, the Wombles are, I, I, it's ridiculous to say that about a, a about a cartoon band, essentially. But they were really under, uh, Chris Spedding, who was another great guitar player, uh, was, uh, was was uh, played on some of these records. Uh, so this just came out. I, I, I got it from Amazon UK. And uh, yeah, I highly recommend it. Um, and remember, you're a Womble, even charted in the US. It's uh, amazing how much great stuff keeps coming out on cd keeps coming out on box sets you know if you're if you're a fan if you're a collector you know it it 
fortunately he does does not stop right now and uh you know that, that's the thank beauty god of yeah and, yeah you know and, and people are always saying you know there's nothing left to release on cd well that's crap well now look, look, stuff look at our guest tonight look at our guest tonight look at everything right. you've just shown and this and the is criers the, yeah. uh, that album's not uh, uh, a classic power pop album Jeremy, if you're still listening, let's get the Criers <laughs> album out. I mean, it's it, it it the first one. It's so it so deserves it. Um, so yeah, and I mean, there's a lot of stuff left to reissue on vinyl. Also, where where is that Holly's mo uh, mono uh, box set of uh, their uh, their '60s re uh, releases? I'd like to see one of those, for example. Um, there's a lot of things. So yeah. yeah, and there will be a lot of things for years to come. And uh, we have to do our best to keep physical product alive. Right. Um, I, I, again, I have nothing against downloads or Spotify. I think they're great for, for what they provide, but they should never be a substitute for the real thing. So everyone keep buying your physical product. Uh, make, make sure that labels are compelled to continue to put it out. Yeah, indeed. That's, that's, that's a very good point. Yeah, yeah. And a busy, busy holiday season. I got, I got basketball season about to start. Oh yeah, it kicks off next week with my, with girls and boys varsity basketball, Haddonfield High, that I make all the noise for as the PA announcing. And uh, so you know that's starting up. Shout out to uh, Vivica Sagastad, who's on my label uh, with her with her Why Not Sisters. They're doing their holiday show all over uh, a New York uh, area. Um, and love to her and her husband, Ken, from the Flesh Tones. Um, and you know how, David, I told you sometimes I walk the dog at, at night and I, you know, we're out for a long time and I, I'm always hungry. I have no idea what I'm going to make for dinner. And I have a neighbor down the street who sometimes will drop off leftovers because her husband doesn't eat leftovers and it's always wonderful stuff that she's cooked. Right. Well, it's now 727 here in New Jersey. So I'm past dinner time. I'm very hungry and I'm thinking, I don't have anything in the refrigerator worth anything. <laughs> and, I, and I just got a text message from the neighbor down the street, Eileen saying, uh, dinner is at your door. Wow. That is so awesome. Thank you so much. I mean, I'm blessed. I'm blessed. I'm grateful to have a great friend like you, David, to be able to do material issues. I'm grateful. Right back uh, at you, sir. Season and a great guest tonight with Rocky Burnett. And oh, yeah. you know, God bless him. We wish him the best. Um, this has and, been a wonderful. And God wonderful. bless everybody who who tunes in to material issues, yeah, uh, whether it be live or on archive. We really appreciate you listening. We're going to do our best to get uh, really cool guests. Yep. Um, I know that I know that we we've been concentrating on you know people who are over fifty, but they're the ones who have the best stories. I do. You know, you can, we could get twenty two year olds to be on, but they don't have the life experience, <laughs> um, and uh, you yeah. know they they weren't around when you know when the record business was really the record business. So we yeah. you know we like to get people on who have stories. Uh, Good story. Otherwise, it's fifteen minutes interview and then forty five minutes of stump the bash, which is okay. But okay, <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's been two weeks, two weeks yeah. with no stump the bash. What this? What's the deal? We've got uh, stump we'll the have bash one. on hold, and we've got uh, who charted the other new yeah, show. We need to do that too. We'll do that too. So we'll figure that out. But you got to stay tuned. You got to join join us here on Facebook. Join the the group. Uh, uh, subscribe over on YouTube, materialissues.com and materialissues.com podbean.com or apple podcast wherever you listen to podcasts just search for material issues and we're on there as well so uh it's great i'm going to leave us with one more little rocky uh, burnett clip because i love it like we Have a great night, everybody. Uh, thank you again for joining us. Absolutely. Tim Allen says, happy holidays to you, Tim. We look forward to it, Tim. And happy holidays to everybody else who's listening. And Tim. I didn't want to leave him out. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, thank you so Tim much for your support. All right. Good night, all. Good night, Mark. <laughs>